You are listening to the Examine Life with Bram Levinson. So, welcome back to the podcast. I had an interesting turn of events occur in the last little while, and it really circles back to uh, something that I have been working on and have been aware of for a very long time in my own development and the way I show up in the world and in certain situations and conversations. Um, and it's actually something that I am writing about in the book that I'm working on that hopefully I will, you know, see published this year, but we'll see. Um, I've always had a big mouth. <laughs> I've always... Uh, been someone who has a very hard time hiding emotion and typically if whatever has triggered me into an emotional state involves someone else and that someone else is in front of me I have a very hard time a hiding what I'm feeling because my face completely gives it away and actually I've been told that my eyes give it away Um, but typically what happens is you know, whatever lands with me lands so intensely that before I know it, I've shifted it through saying something. And typically, this is not uh, helpful. (laughs) Whatever it is that I have said isn't helpful. It is just a way for me to, I suppose, shift whatever that emotion was that had landed so intensely. And I guess on a very primal level, I feel like someone has hurt me by, you know, sort of dumping whatever that emotion was on me. And so the, you know, unconscious reaction to perpetuate any cycle is to pass it on. You know, so somebody hurts me, I want to hurt them. Uh, And it's not a conscious thing. It's something that I think I've been dealing with my entire life. Uh, As a kid, if I was intimidated instead of keeping my mouth shut, I would blurt out something that would ultimately get me into more trouble. You know, I would tell somebody, you know, what I thought of them or or where they could go or what they could do, that kind of thing, you know. Um, And it's something that, especially in my adult life, I have sort of walked a thin line with. Because on the one hand, uh, I want to respect the fact that I can feel, right? I do, I do feel emotions very intensely. Uh, But I also want to make sure that I'm showing up in the world as part of the solution and not part of the problem. And it's in those moments where emotional reaction could shift itself through uh, aggressive wording or aggressive tone and how I speak to people that would actually contribute to me not being part of the solution, but actually, you know, causing damage. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to be... I don't want to be responsible for somebody else's unhappiness or suffering, you know, which is probably one of the motivators for me doing all this other stuff that I do. So with all that said, um, of course, this week I sort of circled back to the Bhagavad Gita because whenever things get very intense uh, for me, whenever there's an intense moment, I like to go back to Hindu scripture because I believe, well, not I believe, I know, you know, the the track record has been that uh, the answers to my questions are found in the scriptures. And this is something that I learned from one of my teachers a decade ago, over a decade ago, when this teacher was going through something in his life, Uh, He told me that after, well, he told us, the students that were with him, that after this event had passed, uh, he went back into scripture and realized that everything that he should have been paying attention to as he was navigating this bump in his life uh, was in scripture. It was all there. He He just wasn't aware of it. He didn't think to reflect back on it. And so that was, for me, almost most important, or more important, rather, than what he was teaching us in terms of Uh, a yoga training, right? Um, But nonetheless, it was it was very helpful for me, it it, it conditioned me or or enlightened me to fall back on scripture in moments when, uh, when I need it, you know, because ultimately, if it's not if it's not helpful in moments like that, then what's the point, you know, 
Um, and I don't want to make it sound like I'm sitting, you know, pouring over scripture every day. I'm absolutely not. I also want to, want to be crystal clear that, you know, when I say scripture, I'm not referring to some crazy dogma. I'm not referring to, uh, you know, shit that isn't actually helpful in a normal everyday life. But nonetheless, I reverted back to uh, the Bhagavad Gita, which is my favorite scripture, I suppose. It's not really scripture. It's an epic, but whatever. I reverted back to it. And, uh, and I, you know, also recently I've been teaching it. I've been teaching the Bhagavad Gita. And one of the parts that I always go over is uh, the part, I believe it's chapter 16, that goes over qualities of one who is honorable and qualities of one who is demonic. And, uh, and again, as I've said before, I think that that's one of the greatest things about the Gita is that it is, it is very honest with us that not everybody is doing their best, that there are demons among us, that there are people around who are just there to stir shit up. And, you know, obviously in, in moments where interactions with these kinds of people occurs, or occur rather, um, I will do my best to, to ask myself, is this person teaching me something? Is there a lesson here? Is this person actually my teacher and not just the person who has, you know, pissed me off? Or is this actually a demon among us? And listen, I think that we can rationalize and justify all we want. I think if you look down south at, you know, the so-called president of the United States, you're looking at someone who is deeply, deeply, deeply traumatized. Am I interested in making excuses for his behavior and his intolerance and his, his hate mongering? No. Not at all. I think that he is a proper demon among us. And I believe that the people who follow him uh, need to wake the fuck up. And some of they, those people might be demons among us. And even some of those who don't support him might be demons among us. Um, and so I love that about the Gita, is that it's very honest about, listen, there are qualities that make up the honorable person and there are qualities that make up the, the demonic. And I'm using that term very specifically, very precisely. Um, so part of the qualities that make up one who is honorable, and I'm paraphrasing, I'm not quoting, um, but some of those qualities are peacefulness, self-control, asceticism, forgiveness, honesty, learning, wisdom, and a firm faith in the Supreme Lord. Now that is a direct quote. Now, there are other qualities that the Gita goes over. These are just some of them. But I wanted to go over these ones because these are the ones that I come back to when I'm trying to uh, move myself out of an emotional state into a so-called reasoning state or rational state. Uh, and it's a, this is what I turn to when I want to sort of do my own work and, and, and really hold myself accountable for, for where I slipped for what I forgot, for for what I did not bring with me into a situation that would have been helpful as opposed to harmful or hurtful. So let's start with peacefulness. I think that innately, we are beings of peace. And I think that the second we are yanked into the game of being a human being and, and conditioned to perform along the structure or within the structure of what, you know, we have created for humanity, I think that's when all of a sudden peace gets disturbed. Uh, obviously, there are other instances or other instigators like, you know, chemical reactions in the brain, like physical pain, all that stuff. But I think that one of the greatest um, causes of peace disturbance is adherence to a structure that perhaps doesn't fit everyone, isn't appropriate for everyone. Um, or playing a game that, that isn't the game that we believe is ours to play, you know, and, and I've spoken about this millions of times. I have written about it in my first book, probably my second book, um, and I think even in the third book that's in the works, but ultimately, you know, just because a million people think something is right doesn't make it right. It just means that a million people agree. And so typically, if everybody is in accordance with an idea or with a concept, that doesn't make it right. It doesn't mean that it's appropriate for everybody else. It just means that the majority has voted. And I have found my existence being very much about uh, moving in the opposite direction of the majority because, I don't know, maybe it's like a Holden Caulfield um, kind of persona or archetype, but I've always been one to, you know, detect bullshit, notice bullshit, call out bullshit in those emotional moments, and often do it in, in, in ways that are not helpful. Um, 
And so for me, I think we're all innate, innately beings of peace. I think that peace gets disturbed and I think it's up to us to uh, bring back that sense of peace. And that's part of my work. My peace will get disturbed when someone uh, shows me how I may have done something wrong. I don't like doing things wrong. I don't like disappointing. And I think this comes from my upbringing. Um, and even if they do it in a polite way, there is a part of me that still reacts like a child. There's a, a very emotional part of me that still gets very, you know, infantile about it. Um, because ultimately, I want to know that I'm doing something properly. And if somebody either points out a different way to do it or or objects, then, you know, I will be open to, to whatever they're telling me. But there is a very visceral part of me that I've learned to work with that really just wants to have it my way, do it my way, and just keep going. So that's part of my work is to maintain that sense of peacefulness, especially in moments where it would be disturbed. And I think that mastering that is absolutely part of my life's work. Uh, but mastering that is also what is going to help me bridge the gap between, you know, doing an okay job in in very trying moments and actually being part of the solution. So peacefulness as a first quality. The second quality, self-control. Now, obviously, this is a massive one. And, and for most people, I believe, who are emotionally brained, uh, I think that this is a huge one. I think a lot of people who come to meditation, who come to yoga, who, who come to any mind-body practice um, are doing it because it is helping them with uh, the control of the self, the lowercase s self. For me, again, that would manifest as, you know, not uh, vomiting my emotions onto somebody, <laughs> for lack of a better term. It means being aware in the moment. It means being present really practicing yoga, which has nothing to do with a physical body posture, but has to do with being present to the moment where all of a sudden I shift into that place where I want to just blurt something out or I want to shift what I'm feeling because it's almost too intense for me to carry within the body and within the brain. Um, and so for me, it really is about controlling that impulse, controlling that, 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 emotional reaction to continue to perpetuate what has landed with me, even if it wasn't meant to land that way, even if the energy that was originally infusing it wasn't what I took. Listen, I can be a sensitive dude. I can see things that aren't there, but ultimately that's my responsibility. You know, I can't expect everybody to tiptoe around me and be extra careful because they're not sure how shit is going to get taken with me, how it's going to land. So my responsibility is really sort of deprogramming the initial response. I think there's a lesson here for every one of us. In most cases, for emotional thinkers, for emotionally brained people, the initial response is not a helpful one. It's a shifting emotion kind of thing. And so for me, it's about deprogramming that initial response. It's about sort of it, wedging something in between stimulus and response, between what has uh, triggered me and, 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 and the response that would help me shift uh, the, the fallout of the trigger, you know. Um, and so for me, a, a really, really um, sort of tangible practice that I have been using uh, is in the moments of where I feel like the emotions start to stir up a sensation in my body, I immediately stop my, myself from speaking I immediately take responsibility. I immediately tell myself, this is my work to do. And instead of being really emotionally charged with what I say or how I say it, I'm very careful about my words. And I do it in almost a very scientific, broken down kind of way. It's weird because you just said this and this is what I feel. And I'm trying to figure out why I feel that. And it, for me, is incredibly, incredibly helpful in avoiding situations where other people get hurt, uh, avoiding situations where all of a sudden there's weird energy between me and somebody else. Um, but it's also me really taking responsibility for the fact that, you know, listen, the way I act by nature, by default, may need a little correction. And I think if every single one of us took that kind of responsibility, I think the world would be a very, very different place. And so when I do it, I also do it for the sake of showing people that it's possible. 
and maybe inspiring them to do the same and hopefully trying to, you know, be the change I want to see in the world, blah, blah, blah. So the first quality is peacefulness and the second quality of one who is honorable, self-control. The third quality, asceticism. Asceticism, for lack of a better definition, is simply avoiding any behaviors uh, or thoughts that are self-indulgent. You know, we tend to indulge in things that make us feel better. We tend to indulge in things that can anesthetize, that can continue to enable bad behavior. But ultimately, Hinduism, yoga studies have taught us that moderation is what we want to sort of work towards. What that means is that there is a certain equanimity. There's a certain sense of unattached neutrality, a coolness. And it's from this perspective that we can see the highs as they occur and we can see the lows as they occur and we don't really uh, get too attached to either of them because we understand that if we buy into when shit goes amazingly, we're going to buy into when things don't. And that's a dangerous game to play. And so avoiding self-indulgence basically means moderation in all things. Moderation when it comes to eating. Moderation when it comes to physical relationships with other people. Moderation in anything that helps us feel better, whether it's spending money, whether it's drinking alcohol, whether it's a drug that we take, whether it is something that we do in excess in order to help ourselves feel better. And that could be anything from what I had just mentioned, you know, the typical identifiable vices that our culture has has sort of agreed on collectively that can be bad for us. Um, but there are also things that could be good for us that people do out of moderation that end up being harmful, like working out too much, like practicing yoga too much, like meditating too much. There are so many things that when taken out of moderation, they may have started out or may have a vibration of, wow, that's great. You're such a great person. Good for you. But when you do it in excess, it's actually not helpful. And not only is it not helpful, it starts to become that thing that we crave. And in the last episode of the podcast, I talked about non-attachment. If we attach in an unhealthy way to something that ultimately it could help us, but ends up harming us because we've taken out a moderation, okay, there's work to do. That's on us. So, so far, the three qualities I've spoken about of one who is honorable, peacefulness, self-control, asceticism. What about forgiveness? I tend to believe that I am a very forgiving pe- uh, person, rather. <laughs> I'm a very forgiving people. All the versions of me that exist in this mind and in this body, we're a very forgiving people. No, um, I believe I am a very forgiving person. Uh, I tend to rem- remind myself, really, that you know we're all playing this game of being human. Every single one of us is going to fuck up on the daily and and if I hold someone else accountable for the rest of my days for a mistake that they may have made, uh, then that means that I can be held accountable for the shit that I've done. And ultimately, I want to be forgiven. I want to do my work to, in order to be able to do better. And so I will afford that same luxury to someone else, even if they've really hurt me. It may take a bit longer for me to truly, truly, truly um, integrate everything I just said to you about forgiveness, but ultimately I I do it. My issue is when people don't do it for me. And I understand people are on their own journeys and I understand that not everybody uh, sort of sees things the way I do. And so it is my responsibility when I am not forgiven uh, to come back to the other qualities, peacefulness and self-control and asceticism so that I can forgive, so that I can then be forgiving for one who might not be as forgiving and let it go. Because ultimately what I've learned about forgiveness is that if I don't forgive, I carry that shit around with me. Okay, so I don't want want to make it sound like when you forgive someone, you're simply getting yourself off the hook from being uh, energetically attached to them for the rest of your life. But there absolutely is an aspect of that. It's an aspect. It's not the totality of forgiveness, but there is definitely an aspect of that. So... Forgiveness as well is not something that is simply unidirectionally uh, sort of, I don't know, streaming outwardly. This is something that every single one of us has to also learn to do for ourselves, forgiving ourselves. Forgiving myself for the moments where I slip, where I have a weak moment, 
a moment of concealment where I'm not my ideal best self. And to be honest, I think that if if I have any success in in what I do in the world, it's because I, I'm not bullshitting about the moments where I do fuck up. I'm not trying to make it seem like, you know, like I'm untouchable and that everything is do as I do as I say, not as I do. Listen, I am a human being as much as anybody else is. It is, you know, part of the reason why I speak so bluntly and honestly when I teach, when I could probably try to rein it in, is because I want people to be left with the impression that I am no different from them and that there is a, a real humanity about me, right? So in the moments where I fuck up, I have learned how to forgive myself. I have learned to tell myself, okay, don't dwell too much on it because it's not helpful. If you want to be part of the solution, give yourself a bit of a break in a way that no one else might and then move on. And the next time a similar situation arises, try and simply show up a little bit differently. Try and, you know, deprogram initial response. Withhold from simply vomiting emotion. And and see if you can maybe show up in a way that's a bit more helpful and a way more condu- and way, in a way rather that is more conducive to peace and to kindness and to being you know, the example of what to do as opposed to what not to do. So, from forgiveness, we move on to honesty. Now, this one's not difficult for me. As a kid, I lived in my own little secret world of my own making in my mind, um, and there was very little honesty. What I have learned throughout the rest of my life is to be honest almost to a fault. And sometimes being this honest ends up being a little bit confrontational, Again, it's a fine line that I walk uh, between being, you know, maintaining the integrity of what I need to communicate while making sure that it lands in a way that isn't harmful. But sometimes it might land as harmful, depending on who I'm dealing with, depending on their psychological profile, depending on their triggers and their pasts. Uh, You know, sometimes when something needs to be dealt with, I can't be responsible for making sure that everybody's okay. My responsibility in many, many moments is to simply make sure that whatever the elephant is in the room is, is, is not invisible, that it's being addressed. Because I had spent way too much time as a kid pretending shit wasn't happening, and that's not happening anymore. I'm done with that. So, you know, honesty. Honesty, and if you circle back, honesty, mix it with peacefulness. Mix it with self-control. Combine it with moderation, asceticism. Mix it with forgiveness. Because if you bring all of those other qualities into honesty, all of a sudden that will be less confrontational and potentially less harmful. What about learning? Learning for me is essential. I never stop learning. I'm not a fan of traditional lines of education, traditional avenues of education, unless, unless one is training to do something that is you know, specifically demanding uh, in terms of qualifications. So if you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, obviously go to school and do what you got to do. Psychologist, psychiatrist, whatever. Um, But for me, learning has been, number one, about learning what interests me as opposed to just doing what society thinks I should do and get a job and pay my taxes and shut the fuck up. And then it's been about learning what would complement what I already do. You know, me studying psychology is helpful because there is a definite intersectionality between psychology and Hinduism. Me studying things like uh, post-traumatic stress disorder is helpful because the people I work with may be suffering from it, so I need to be able to recognize signs of it. Me studying all kinds of spiritual paths, uh, different you know, Hindu sects, uh, different types of philosophies, t- different types of mythologies, all of these things help me become more of who I believe I need to be in the world and to do what I believe is my journey and is my mission to do. So for me, it is an endless process of education and not just from, you know, books and, and, and resources and references. It's also about life. It's about letting my higher education teach me and being present enough to the lessons that experience has for every single one of us. So I'm always learning. And I I honestly believe that the more you learn, the more you realize that you have to learn. So, you know, I'm doing my best to pick my battles as to what I believe is mine in order to, or or rather mine to learn stuff that I need to sort of integrate into what I do to make it not only more, um, how can I put this, 
more of service to other people and more efficient in how it is of service, but also I want to keep that expression uniquely mine. So I need to be able to extrapolate theories and ideas without necessarily uh, copying or um, how can I put this? I don't want to use other people's languaging. You know, I, I haven't read Brene Brown, I think her name is, or, or Eckhart Tolle. I haven't read these people's books, seen them speak or anything because what I, I believe that my expression is unique. I think we're all saying the same things in different languaging, but I don't want their languaging to become my languaging because then all of a sudden I have gotten in the way of this expression, which for me is, is a divine one. And, and ultimately, uh, if I block it, I'm, that's on me. You know, that's me getting in my own way. So learning for me is huge. And then wisdom will listen. Life has taught me so much so far. A lot of the wisdom that I've learned relates to what to pay attention to and what not to pay attention to. Wisdom for me is about knowing when I am getting in my own way and then getting the hell out of it. Wisdom for me has been about owning my own shit and understanding that though the expression itself may be divine, the body that it l works through is not. And the conditioning that the body and the brain have gone through is, is you know, needs to be unpacked a little bit. And some systems need to be dismantled sometimes, and that's okay. Um, and so, you know, for me, that is wisdom. But let me reiterate that, knowing what not to pay attention to, that's a huge one especially right now, especially in this moment in time with, you know, pandemics and, and abuses of power and tyrants and intolerance and, and, and dissension and conflict. It is very easy to get tweaked into reaction and to get pulled into every single person's fight and everybody's battle. And the fact of the matter is, if I did that, I'd have nothing left to offer anyone. So I have to be very specific about which battles are mine to fight. I do the work that comes to me to quote the Bhagavad Gita. And ultimately, that for me is wisdom. And so I can't say that it's going to be the same for you. But I, one thing I can say is know what not to pay attention to. That doesn't mean that you don't pay attention to anything. It means choose. See what resonates with you on a felt sense level in the body and choose. Now, the last quality that I want to speak to you about, about uh, that, that makes up someone who is honorable, from the Bhagavad Gita, a firm faith in the Supreme Lord. Now, this is a big ask. This is a huge ask. Because ultimately it's saying, believe in God. And we have been fed so many versions of God throughout history. And there have been so many abuses of power in the name of God. That this is a massive ask. At least it is for me. I don't know about you, but it is for me. I don't necessarily believe in anyone else's God. I believe in the concept of one universal energy that animates all beings. I don't believe that this is an energy that we are meant to come to when things go wrong and we need some help. We're like, please, God, I know we haven't spoken in a while, but could you help me out? I mean, what the actual fuck? Really? I believe that heaven and hell exist now, and we create them for ourselves. I believe that, you know... Spirit expresses itself in a myriad of ways. And what I have a firm faith in is that that energy that expresses itself through me has a wisdom to it that if I keep doing this work, I will perhaps touch once, maybe twice, three times in a lifetime. And so that is, I suppose, if there is a goal to this whole journey of mine, it's that. It's to touch that wisdom, to see things for how they are, not how I have misinterpreted them to be. Um, and to really have faith in something else. That's it. It's not something that's going to pull me into a synagogue or a church. I will walk into synagogues and churches only because I think they're beautiful, quiet, beautiful, peaceful, lovely spaces. But I'm not going to go there to find God. God is in the microphone that I'm holding right now. God is in the, 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 the syllable of the words that I'm uttering, the syllables, rather. God is in every single thing, if you choose to believe that. I, God is in belief, you know. Um, so when I say God, I'm not really referring to, and I don't think anybody else's version of God. I'm just saying, for me, that's what faith is. And, and I do have a very unwavering faith, largely due to my education in Hinduism and the... 
the amount of freedom that it allowed me in terms of finding my way forward in faith and spirituality. So, again, let me just recap. These, these good qualities that make up someone who is honorable from the Bhagavad Gita, peacefulness, self-control, asceticism, forgiveness, honesty, learning, wisdom, and a firm faith in the Supreme Lord. One more thing I want to say about that last one, a firm faith in the Supreme Lord. You can absolutely choose to not believe in God. One way you can apply this teaching, having a firm faith in the Supreme Lord, how would you describe God? Let's say God was it were a character in a comic book. What are the characteristics that you would give God? The ones that I would give would be things like merciful, generous, kind, compassionate, giving. What you can do is have faith in any of those qualities. Because if you do that, then you have found something to put your faith in. And I believe that we need to put our faith in something and have a strong, strong anchor in that faith. So, with all that said, I hope that you find some help here. I think I hope you find some, some direction here, something of interest, some insight. Give it all a good think. And I'll see you later. This has been The Examine Life with Bram Levinson.